for, for the past few weeks, my heart has been focusing on the theme of the character of God, the love of God, the kind of person God is. And I'm not inclined to switch from this theme this morning. I'm going, I'm going to continue to build on it. I, I, what I want to share is perhaps in some respects, a revision, a repetition of some of the things we said last week and previously, but I, I, I continue to be blessed by the understanding of the kind of relationship God wants to have with us. I continue to be blessed by this. And as long as it's burning my heart, I'm not going to change from this, this theme because, you know, I have, I have found out something. I, th there are many different perspectives on the gospel. But I have found out, I think we have all discovered that the, the, the true heart of the gospel, the greatest good news. Some people say it's that there's only one God. Some people say it's that Christ is our righteousness. Some people say that it's the grace of, but the, the, the greatest good news, ultimately, when you break through everything and you get to the final kernel, the heart of it all, the good news is the kind of person that the God of the universe is, the kind of person God is. This is the greatest news in the universe. It is the knowledge that all men need. There's no knowledge to be compared with this. After 45 years as a Christian, learning and studying and digging and delving, this is my conclusion. There's no knowledge higher than this. And it's the, it's the knowledge that is the key to all the dreams and the desires and the hopes that we have had as Christians. This knowledge is the key. This morning I want to title our, our thoughts, the name of God, the name of God. And I know that this title itself can be provocative because there are so many ideas about the name. Even recently I received a, a, a kind message from a dear sister who is concerned about the use of the name when we address God or when we speak about God. She was concerned. She, she was not trying to be offensive. She just wanted to share with me that she has a deep concern on her heart that we ignore the name of God. We do not actually call him by his right name, which identifies him. The name, some would say it's Jehovah, if you're a Jehovah's Witness. witness. Some would say it's Yahweh. If you are from a different group and some would say it's Yahuwah and there are different ways that people think it should be pronounced but there are many people who are con concerned that we should use the right sound the right pronunciation the right word in referring to the creator so i'm going to kind of use this as the as one of the bases for what i have to share today and i'm going to go to my Bible screen, of course. I'd like everything as always to be based on primarily what the Bible says, although I'm going to divert from that a little bit today. Now, there's a song. I don't know how many of us know this song, but there's a song that is entitled, um, I think it's El Shaddai. But if you know the song, it says, um, El Shaddai, El Shaddai, El Elyon or Adonai. Age to age, you are still the same. You know the song, right? El Shaddai, El Shaddai. It's, 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 it's referring to the titles of God as they are expressed in the Hebrew. I, I, the, these are titles that are used in the Bible. For example, in Genesis 1 and verse 1, which we have on the screen before us, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The word God here is from the word Elohim. So in the very first verse of the Bible, there is a word used. It's not Jehovah. It's not El Shaddai. It's not Adonai. It's, it's, um, it's Elohim. And what it really means is mighty God. We who have been preaching the truth about God, one of the things we have said is that the word Elohim does not speak about three gods or three beings or three in one. This is what Trinitarians suggest. But we know that the word Elohim is a word meaning God, but it is pluralized to demonstrate that God is mighty. He's great. So they pluralize the word. 
So we have the word Elohim as a first word in the Bible that refers to God. And what it means simply is mighty God. That word alone tells me that if somebody says you can't use any other word to refer to God, the very first verse in the Bible would contradict that because here he's referred to as mighty God. When you go to Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1, you come upon another title of God or another name of God. It says in verse 1, Genesis 17, and when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord, that is Yahweh or Yahuwah, however, however we pronounce it, Yahweh appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. The word almighty God, the phrase is El Shaddai. El Shaddai. So El Shaddai means the almighty God. So God says, it says, Jehovah appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And again, this is one another name that God claims as his own and that he asks Abraham to remember. I am El Shaddai. So I would say that if God says, I am El Shaddai, you would not be out of place if you referred to God as El Shaddai either. I'm El Shaddai, walk before me and be thou perfect. Then in Genesis 18, verse 3, Genesis 18, this is where Jesus and the two angels came down to Abraham. And here Abraham addresses Jesus, God, the Lord, and he says, it says, and he said, my Lord, and the word used here is Adonai. My Adonai. Now, if you look at the Strong's Concordance, it will tell you that Adonai is a word that is used to refer to the Lord, to refer to God. It means Lord. But when you refer to God as Lord, you use the word Adonai. So Abraham says, my Adonai, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. So you have already, by the time you come to the 18th chapter of, of, of the Bible, you have already three titles. And you're going to see that there are, there's more than three. There are, there are at least three titles that God gives that are that are used to refer to God. Elohim, El Shaddai, and Adonai. When you go to Genesis 14, you go back to Genesis 14 and verse 18. It says, and Melchizedek was a king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the most high God. Here you find another title for God. The word here is, or the phrase here is El Elyon. El Elyon, and it means the most high God. So you see Elohim, the mighty God. El Shaddai, God Almighty. El Elyon, the most high God. Adonai, Lord. All of these are, 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 are phrases that are used to refer to God in the Old Testament, right there in the very first book. When you go a little further now, you go to Exodus chapter 6 and verse 3. Exodus 6 and verse 3. And God says something a little strange here. He says, and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of El Shaddai, by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah, Yahweh, Yahuwah, whichever, however you, however you pronounce it was I not known to them. It's interesting because when you go back to um, Genesis and other places, you see where the word Jehovah is used. But it seems like even though the word Jehovah was used by the person who was writing the book, at the time when these men were alive, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they didn't actually know God by that name. They knew him by the name El Shaddai, God Almighty. But God says, they did not know my name, Jehovah. They did not know that aspect of, of, of me. What we know, brothers and sisters, what all of us are quite familiar with is the idea that the name in the Bible, a name signifies the character or the characteristics of a person. We understand this. So when I was a boy, I, I, when I was a little boy, I was a little, I was troublesome and I was very, I was hyperactive. And so my mother used to refer to me as Jim Breeze. That is when I was like two, three, maybe four, my mother referred to me as Jim Breeze. And after a while, they started calling me Jimmy. My first recollections of my, myself was, my name was Jimmy. And um, I remember one day a lady came to the home 
she might have been a nurse or something, but she came to the home and as usual, I was giving my mother trouble and skipping about. And, and, and the lady said, you should call him by his right name, call him by his name, David, and then maybe he will stop being so troublesome. I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but after that, everybody made an effort to call me by my name, David, and then the word Jimmy disappeared. But I was known by um, Jimmy at first. And it, I just say this to illustrate what I'm trying to say that a name is often fixed to somebody because of your characteristics. In, in Jamaica, especially in high school, everybody gets a nickname. If you don't get a nickname, you're not a normal child. When I was going to school, I like to boast that I had three different bloods in me. I was, I, 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 my father was, was, was Negro. My mother was, my, my grandfather on my mother's side was Chinese. My grandmother on my mother's side was Indian. So I used to boast that I had three different kinds of bloods. Of course, I was promptly labeled bloods. All the time I was going to school, high school, they nicknamed me bloods. That's what they used to refer to me as, me and my brothers. So everybody, <laughs> Um, has, a, has a nickname in high school. But what I'm saying is that you get a name because of some characteristic. There was a boy who had a sink in his head. His name was Saddlehead. Saddlehead. So everybody had a name. And um, it usually had to do with some characteristic that was linked to that person. So each of these names of God is a name that describes the characteristic of God. The mighty God, Elohim, the mighty God. Notice it's not just God, it's the mighty God. Then El Elyon, the, 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 the El Shaddai, the almighty God. El Elyon, the most high God. Adonai, Lord. And then finally you had Yahweh, which is the self-existent one. The God who exists by himself. He doesn't need anybody. He doesn't need any help. He doesn't need any source, nothing. He just exists. He is self existent. Now, all of these are legitimate titles of God, but I want you to notice something. Every one of them is based upon the greatness and the mightiness of God. Every one of these titles is focused on the greatness of God. These, these titles, they they bring out respect, fear, awe. You think of God as a king. And when you think of the king, what do you think about? I mean, every time you hear people talk about the king of a certain country, they are focusing on greatness and um, honor and, and everybody uh, being above everybody else. Even the queen of England, a little old lady who is just about on her deathbed. But by virtue of the fact that she's called queen, everybody uh, reveres this, this little old lady. The, the magazines jump on every word she says. Every time she appears in a photo, it's all over the news media. You think of, uh, when you think of king or queen, this is what you think of. When you think of Lord, you think of obedience and submissiveness. When you say somebody is, is Lord, what comes to mind is that when this person speaks, you obey. You submit to this person. You don't defy the person or try to uh, resist the person's will. Now, like most of you, my first perceptions of God, my first perceptions, even from I was a little child, was kind of not even like Santa Claus, not even like that. It, it, yeah, kind of, because in a way, Santa Claus is able to give you good things, but he's watching you. He's watching you to see if you behave properly and you deserve, and then you, you will obtain. For me, the, the idea I had of God for most of my life was that he is unpredictable. He's a bit frightening and unpredictable. You don't want to encounter him sometime in the dark or sometime when you're not fully prepared. You're always a little tentative because you have to be fully prepared. And look here, the Bible encourages this idea. I got this idea from the Bible. Those who taught me, they got this idea from the Bible. Look at this statement. Exodus 3 and verse 5. Look at this. In verse 4, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, when, when Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see, 
God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. Elohim called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And he said, draw not nigh hither. Don't come near. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet. For the place where thou standest is holy ground. Look here, this is kind of frightening because look here. This person is so holy. Even your shoes offend him. Even your shoes are an offense to him. These are the stories that you, you feed on as a child. These are the stories that are, are fed to you in, in Sabbath school and, and in, in, your, in your earliest awareness of God. God is a fearsome person. I, I kind of understand when, um, you know, I, I see the arguments that some people have that you, you, if you are coming into the presence of God, you need to cover your head if you're a lady. lady. You have to have your head covered. So there are whole there there are whole doctrines that are based upon this. There are people who believe you cannot be saved if if, if a lady comes to pray and she, her head is not covered. And you have a statement like this in the Bible that kind of encourages that kind of thinking. Your shoes, get your shoes off. There are some churches I know where you don't enter with your shoes. I think in 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 um Islamic congregations in um. In the mosque, if I'm not mistaken, well, at least some of them, you have to take off your shoes when you are going inside. You don't go to worship with shoes on your feet. And here is a scripture. Here is a, a biblical passage that supports that kind of idea. You come into the presence of God, take your shoes off your feet because shoes are offensive to God. He's a little, he's a little intimidating. He's a little frightening. Here are some more statements that um. The, these are these are built into our subconscious. Habakkuk 1 and verse 13. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. This is God. This is the Bible. Okay, this is this is the book that we say determines what we believe and how we behave. Here it says of God in the book of, of the, 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 the prophet Habakkuk. God is of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. In fact, if you go to Job, Job says it a little uh, even more strikingly. Job, Job says in Job 15 verses 15 and 16, Behold, he putteth no trust in his saints. Yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. How much more abominable and filthy is man? which drinketh iniquity like water. Do you qualify? Are you among those who drink iniquity like water? Well, you might say, well, I only take a little sip now and then. But if, if you are honest and you're like me, you will have to concede that there are many times when you don't qualify to stand in the presence of God. Based on statement like this, how much more God puts no trust, he has no confidence in his, in his saints. Much more the people who are involved with iniquity, the people who drink iniquity like water. And yet God is of purer eyes than to behold evil. God cannot look upon evil. God is holy so that when you come into his presence, you take off your shoes. He's pure and holy. He's awesome. He's great. He's mighty. He's God almighty, but he's frightening. He's fearsome and is frightening. In Proverbs 15 and verse 3, here's what it says to, to make matters even worse. It says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. He sees, it's, it's like the song that's, that says, you know, Santa Claus is coming to town. You, um, he, he, he knows when you are sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you have been good or bad. So be good for goodness sake. He's making a list, checking it twice, finding out who has been naughty or nice. Santa Claus is coming to town. A, little, a silly little song, but when you, when you look at the words, it, it kind of reflects the perspectives we have of God. And I'm saying that these are real perspectives. Uh, uh, we, we grew up with this, all right? And, and the majority of the religious world still lives with this. They live with this and they have justification because these are statements from the Bible. I'm reading from the Bible. In Hebrews 4 and verse 13, which is New Testament. 
It says, neither is there any creature which is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. I know. I, sometimes I wonder. I don't know. Sometimes I wonder if, if we all are similar. Okay. I, I remember Sister Jen was in our, our meeting one night, and I, I love Sister Jen because she's not afraid to expose herself, right? I love when people are there, there, themselves. I have a hard time doing it, except when I'm preaching. But I, 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 because of this, I admire people. But Sister Jen said that um, that she had a desire. She had a, she had she had thoughts in her mind of killing people. I don't know if any of you remembered. She was on um, the testimony meeting one Friday night, and she said when she was in earlier days, for some reason she had a she had a desire. She was planning how to kill people. It takes a lot of courage to do that, but. That was kind of reassuring to me because I don't really have plans how to kill people, but sometimes some thoughts pass through my mind. I would not expose them. I would not let anybody know. The reason being that I don't want you to know what is hidden inside of my heart, outside of God, in my heart, outside of God. There's nothing good. Okay, I know this every day. And it's good too because it makes me depend on God. It's good for me. It's good for me. It makes me depend on God because I know without him what I'm capable of. Things that, that, that would shock other people. I am capable of it. So the verse says, everything is naked and open under the eyes of the one that we are dealing with. He knows my thoughts. He knows what is inside. He knows what I'm capable of. God knows all of this. When you consider it, it can be very frightening. And, and, and you can think, where can I go to escape his eyes? But you know you can't escape. So how do you deal with this? It's like he's a universal watcher and he's always making sure that he has his eye on you. As a matter of fact, it's like, it's like he's a great probation officer. Jesus told the story of a man who had a fig tree and the fig tree was bearing nothing. And then he said in verse seven, in Luke chapter 13 and verse seven, then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none, cut it down. Why is it cumbering the ground? Why is it taking up space? Cut it down. And he answering said unto him, Lord, leave it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. What is this story saying? This story is saying that God is saying, okay, all, all this time you have been wasting space. I'm ready to, to, to wipe you out, but, but I'm going to give you another, a little more chance. I'm going to give you a little more time. And if you, if, if, if you begin to produce fruit, well, but if not, then you are going to be cut off. This is the point of the story. And I'll tell you, there are Christians who feed on these things. This is, these are the things they preach. I grew up hearing sermons like, God is particular. That's one particular sermon I remembered where they talked about how, how Uzzah touched the ark and he was smitten dead. They talk about how God, God is not to be trifled with. Because if you play with God, you are liable to suffer the consequences. That was hard for me because I was somebody who liked to play and to tease people. So then to be told that God doesn't play around, it was hard for me. And, you know, maybe, maybe that is part of the reason why when I could, I got away from religion. I got away from God because God wasn't about to tolerate my foolishness. God is not only probation officer waiting to see if you will bring forth fruit, but he's also judge and executioner. In, in, in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 14, let's start with 13 because 13 is a favorite verse. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. God is judge and he's going to consider every single thing you ever did and thought, the secret things. He's going to consider that too when he brings you into judgment. When you tie that to verses like this, Isaiah 63 and verse six, I will tread down the people in my anger and make them drunk in my fury. And I will bring down their strength to the earth. 
Jeremiah 7 20. Therefore, thus said the Lord God, Behold, mine anger and my fury shall be poured out upon this place, upon man and upon beast and upon the trees of the field and upon the fruit of the ground, and it shall burn and shall not be quenched. All right, enough of that. But you understand what I'm saying. You can come to the Bible legitimately and you can end up being very frightened of God. And this is why I, I, I think it is most important that we address this issue and we come to the right conclusion and we are able to share it with other people. To be honest, this morning is not long enough to say all the things that I would like to say, but I'm going to try to see if I can cover the main points. Now, when you go to the New Testament, when you go to the teachings of Jesus, Jesus is trying to move the world from the old covenant to the new covenant. Jesus is trying to do this. In, with one hand, he's telling the people that they are still to respect the law. One jot or one tittle shall not pass from the law till all be fulfilled. On the other hand, he's trying to say to his people, we are in the process of moving to a different phase, a different system, a different understanding. He's trying to say both things. And so sometimes you find that some of his statements seem to be difficult to understand. But here's one that is not so difficult. John 17 and verse 6. Here's what Jesus says. I have manifested thy name. He's talking to God. He's talking to El Shaddai, El Elyon, Elohim, Yahweh. And he refers to him as Father. He says, and now, O Father. It's almost like a new name. I think there's only one or two places in the Old Testament where God is ever referred to as Father. And it's kind of like in a formal way. But here's what Jesus says. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. All right. So these are the 12 disciples and maybe a few other followers. And Jesus says, I have manifested your name. Uh, it's interesting that he does not say, I have told your name. I have expressed your name you could have said it several ways but he says i have manifested and the word manifest means i have revealed i have made it known i have, I have exposed it you go to the books of matthew mark luke and john you will never find one single verse where jesus says god's name is so and so not even one verse you'll never find a verse where god say, where jesus says my father's name is El Shaddai, Elohim, Yahweh, whatever. He doesn't say that. But here he says, I have manifested your name. And what we understand, because we have, we, we have been looking at this before, what we understand is that Jesus was saying, I have made the character of my father known. Because a name in the Bible, as I pointed out earlier on, is primarily focused on a, an expression of a person's character some characteristic and jesus says i have made your i have made your name known i have revealed your name in other words i have i have opened up your character to these men that you have given me out of the world so when we come to the new testament and we are looking for the name of god what we are looking for brothers and sisters is what character was revealed about god not what sound was used to do, to, to to address god not the sound that was used not the title that was expressed, but the character that was revealed. This is most important when we are considering the question of what is the name of God. It's the most important thing of all. In John 1 and verse 18, and there, there, there are quite a few verses. I won't go to all of them. John 1 and verse 18. It says, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he hath declared him. Notice the, 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 the opposing ideas here. Nobody has seen God. But what did Jesus do? Jesus declared God, meaning that Jesus made us see God. Jesus made us see God. No man has seen God at any time, but because of Jesus, we have seen God because Jesus declared him. Jesus made him known in such a way that we have actually seen God. So you, you, you understand that there is a, a kind of tension here, a kind of conflict between 
the physical things that people look for and what Jesus actually came to reveal. It's like it's like Second Corinthians chapter four, where it says that we see the glory of God expressed in the face of Jesus Christ. We see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So we have seen God because if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. That again is another striking, striking statement that tells us that the important thing is not the sound that you make when you speak of God. The important thing is when you look at God, what do you see? What do you see when you look at God? And Jesus says, I have declared him. If you see me, you have seen him. I am the express image of my father. You see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This, if you can understand it, is the true name of God. Now, let's go a little further. There are two, two names that Jesus gave us concerning God. In this context, I'm going to say there are two names. We looked at the Old Testament and we saw, I, I, we, we pointed to four names. Was it four or five? Um, Elohim, Adonai, El Elyon, El Shaddai, Yahweh. We looked at five names and there are more. In, in um, Jeremiah, he's referred to as Yahweh Tzidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. So there are, there are many names. Yahweh Nisi, the Lord our banner. Many names, but in the New Testament here, there are two that we find in Jesus that I want to focus on, two names of God. And I believe these are the two great names that we need to remember. Luke 11 and verse 2. Whatever name the Jews love to call God by, they stopped calling him Yahweh or Jehovah because they said the name was too holy to call. It's kind of like take off your shoes off your, your, your feet. They, they, they had this tendency to become obsessed with, to, to fail to get the point. It's like when Moses made the, the, the serpent out of brass. They never got the spiritual lesson. In, instead, over 400 years later, maybe about 800 years later. Right, let me not mix up the time. It's at least 400 and something years later. They are still worshiping this serpent of brass they put it on a pole and they are still burning incense to this mindless senseless meaningless thing hundreds of years later because they missed the point in the same way they have stopped saying yahweh now they are calling him lord whatever that word is whatever word they were using and jesus comes and he says to his disciples when you pray say our father which art in heaven when you pray, refer to God as your father. Now, is he just using phrases and ideas? In Jamaica here, we don't have this strong separation between church and state that Americans seem to be obsessed with. In school, every school that I ever attended, they always had a little devotion in the morning. And um, one of the things that they taught us to, as children, they taught us to say the Lord's Prayer. I didn't learn that only in, ch in, in church. I also learned that in school. We would say the Lord's Prayer at the end of devotion each, each morning in school when they had a general assembly. And you had to learn it just as it is in the Bible. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It became like a mantra, something you recited. It never really meant something personal. And again, this demonstrates the human instinct, the human uh, nature to vocalize something without understanding. Jesus was not in the habit of doing this. When Jesus says, when you pray, say, our Father, which art in heaven, what I believe we should do is take that prayer, analyze it and see what are the elements of this prayer and what, and, and this tells us how we should approach God. Anyway, the main point I want to make is that Jesus said, when you pray to God, your perspective of God, your idea of God should be that you're coming to your father. He wasn't just saying, use the word. That's what a legalist would say. Use the word because Jesus said, use the word. Well, suppose I say, daddy, have I violated the Lord's prayer? And suppose I miss out the part about which art in heaven. You see what I'm saying? We, we, we don't want to focus on the, the secondary things and the things that are 
not so important. It's the meaning that we should focus on. So Jesus said, God is our father. And when we come to God, that is our perspective. It's kind of hard because not everybody has a good father. I've, I've heard people say that some of the stories I tell are a little difficult for them to, 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 to uh, grasp because they had a bad father. You know, a lot of the time I like to talk about my relationship with my children or my grandchildren and with my own father, but some people have a bad father. And so when I talk about the goodness of a father, they can't relate. So I understand the challenge that is there. But when Jesus said our father, he was talking about a good father because that's what most fathers are. In their fatherhood, they love their children. So, but when, 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 you talk, when, when I deal with my father, there's something, when you talk about father, two things come to my mind. Number one, respect. I respect my father. Number two, I depended on my father. Number three, I obeyed my father. Respect, dependence, and obedience. So, even when my father was around, I'll tell you this. I was never quite 100% myself. Even though my father was a good father, he was also in, he was also responsible for my training. I was never quite 100% free with my father. I was always trying to behave in a way that he would be pleased with me. When my father died, I, went, I was in Germany, or I went to Germany shortly after, and there was a song that my friend Erwin prayed, uh, played. And the words kind of stuck in my mind. It says, gonna wrap my arms around my daddy's neck and tell him that I missed him. Tell him all about the man that I became and hope that it pleased him. That last line, hope that it pleased him. Even in this verse that talks about meeting my father again, there's a statement that says, I'm still wanting to meet your approval. And it's true. I was always like that with my father. I, it, was, it, it was pleasing to me to hear my father say, you have done well, son. You have done well. I wanted his approval. I, 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 there are words I would say around my brothers that I wouldn't say in my father's presence. There are, there are stories I would tell with my brothers that I wouldn't tell if my father was there. I was never quite 100% free to be myself. Look at John 15 and verse 15. Jesus says, Henceforth, from this moment, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. From this moment, I have called you friends. I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my father, I have made known unto you. So, oh, yeah. Jesus goes a step further. And he goes from, oh, yeah. from God being our father, he goes to God being our friend. And what makes a you friend? He says, he says, the difference is that you know my secrets. The difference is that you know the truth about my heart. A friend is able to enter into this, the heart, to the mind, to the, to, the, to the, he knows another person down on that intimate level. That's what makes you friend to the person. A friend, why do you want to be around your friend? Because you want to, not because you must. Not because you must. Anytime you have to be around a person, you're under pressure. Anytime there is a necessity for you to be there, you're under pressure. There is an element of discomfort. When you have a true friend, what makes it good is that I can go if I want and I can stay away if I want. And whether I go or stay, we're cool. We're comfortable. We're easy with each other. Regardless, there are no demands, no pressure. I can be myself. And so Jesus gives us this other name of God, father and friend. And as I pointed out last week, there is only one place in the entire Bible where God ever reveals himself in that kind of way. And it is where he says in Isaiah 42, 
Abraham, my friend, Abraham, my friend. You never ever think of God in that way. God is king, God is ruler, God is El Shaddai, El Elyon, Yahweh Almighty. He's all these things. He's the God that when you come near, you take off your shoes off your foot. He's awesome. He's great. He loves me. But he's frightening. He is difficult to understand, and it is best to be a little bit cautious around him, even when he's your father. But when he comes as friend, to be honest, even for me, this is an idea that I'm, I'm, I'm treasuring, I'm cherishing, because it is, it, even though it's something I've, that, that, that I have been, the friendship of God and the love of God are, are themes that I have loved for a long time. But I'm seeing even more. I'm seeing even more. I'm asking myself questions, and I'm seeing more that is making me so, 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 so much more comfortable with God. You see, as I pointed out last week, what is the thing about friends? Friends, the thing about friendship is that the relationship is reciprocal. I want you and you want me. Have you seen one-sided friendships? Have you seen a man pursuing a woman? Have you seen somebody trying to be friends with somebody else and the person trying to avoid him? Does that ever work? How does that feel? But in true friendship, it's two-sided. God is pursuing you and you are pursuing God. It makes a wonderful combination. It brings marvelous results. But then I ask the question, what does God want of me? What does God want of me? Okay, he wants you to glorify him. Well, immediately I'm under pressure. You want me because I can offer you something. Immediately I'm under pressure. I want you because you can promote my righteousness. I want you because you can teach people about the lifestyle I want them to live. Okay, I'm a useful tool. Is that what I mean to you? Is that why you have interest in me? It doesn't satisfy me when I think of this. And I ask myself the question, why does God bother with me? Because you see, a part of what I'm doing, brothers and sisters, and you have to forgive me, because a part of what I'm doing is I'm reasoning about this as well. I'm reasoning about this as well. There are some things that the Bible says and you have to reason about it. Like, for example, when the Bible talks about God roasting people forever, I like to talk about that because that is so ridiculous and so impossible. Yet the Bible uses the phrases, and you have to think about it, and you have to reason about it, and you have to find a way to explain it in keeping with the idea of the God of love. When the Bible talk, uh, uh, reveals to me a God who seems to be hard and difficult to get along with, I am going to reason about that. I'm going to think about that and try to find the other places that balance this. Because that is not the only information we can find about God. We have to think about it and try to bring the information together in such a way that it gives us a true picture of God. So I ask myself, why does God bother with me? Look here, you gave me your commands, okay? You, 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 you gave me your salvation. You put Jesus on the cross. And he died for me. Okay, I understand. Now I am saved. Now I am here to glorify you. Now you can be done with me, right? You have given me the, the you have saved me. You have given me the instructions. You have put me in, in, in your family. Now you can, can be done with me. No, 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 no. He says, I'm not done. I want you. I want you. I desire fellowship with you. That is what blows my mind praise the lord brother david for that truth praise the lord i gave you my rules i gave you my instructions i put you in my family i gave you everything you need now i've got other business to attend to no 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 he says that is not what i was really after what i was after is you i wanted you and i say what for why bother with me what can i do can i make you better can I make you greater? Can I enhance the name of Almighty God? Can I, can I step into the universe and do something for God? Me, a little flea? No, but I want you still. Why? Because I value your friendship. Because I value your friendship. To be wanted for myself. Why does he value my friendship? And it's the truth. My heart knows it is the truth. And I can find the reasons for it. You know, 
I always speak about my, my, my relationship with my children, my grandchildren, because that's where I learn a lot too, right? When, 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 my, when my grandson comes, what does he have to give me? He is more, he's more trouble than anything else because I have to keep my eyes on him. If he goes outside, I have to see that he's, he, he stays in the yard. He always wants me to make something for him, to draw a picture for him, to, to, to make something, and he takes my time. And he comes in, and while I'm trying to work, he's talking. I would not have it any other way. If he does not come, I'm concerned. Sometimes he wants, he's feeling a little uncomfortable. He comes and sits in my lap. When he sits down, his little bones are sticking me. <laughs> and he's getting heavy. I don't want him to move. I will suffer the inconvenience. I don't want him to move. Why? There is no reason. We cannot, we cannot discuss like when my, when my son comes and we're on the same intellectual level, we can talk about high things. When this little boy comes, all he wants to talk about is what I would consider foolishness. I don't want, I don't want it any other way. Why? I don't even know the, the reason why. I don't even know the reason why, but I'll tell you what. I understand why God wants me when I think about that. Because I have nothing to give him in the same way. I'm a little annoyance. I'm a little, a little pest. I just get in the way and I just keep messing up. He doesn't care. He wants me for his friend. So, you know, I asked myself the question, am I reasonable? Am I thinking reasonably? Am I not, am, am I not trying to bring God down to a human level? So let me reason with you a little bit, brothers and sisters. Let me reason. Here is this God Almighty, and he creates the universe, all right? He has a mind that you cannot even begin to comprehend. You can't imagine the greatness of this God. You cannot, you cannot begin. I won't even try because I will, I will dishonor him to even try to explain how great God is and the kind of mind that he has. And he decides to create us, okay? And what does he create us for? That's the question. What does he create us for? So he can, he can look at these little Lego toys running about the place and amuse himself watching us hurt each other and, and, and bumble about. Is that what he wants? What does almightiness want? What does God Almighty want? What does a heart that is so great? What can you do to fulfill the desires of God? You know, the only thing that I think that, we can, that, that God could ever want in this universe is friendship. What else can you give him? What else can you give God to make God happy? The only thing, if, if, if you put yourself in the shoes of God Almighty, the only thing he wants is a heart that can warm to his heart. Tell me something else. Tell me something else. Tell me some ambition that God could have. Tell me something anybody could give God to give God who has everything, who created everything. What can you give to God? The only thing that can meet God's heart is that God made us independent so that when we turn to him, we can experience true friendship. He knows we are not robots. We are free and we love him and we want him. We can experience it and so he can be happy in that knowledge. I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story. I almost entitled my message this morning, A Tale of Two Rats. I almost titled this sermon, A Tale of Two Rats. But I'm going to tell you my story anyway. But I'm not going to give it that title. The title is a little too melodramatic. But one of the things that... um. One of the peculiarities about my, my home is, is my, my wife's abhorrence for all kinds of rodents, okay? If you must know, my, my house has to be sealed with mesh over the windows and the door. We have to have a screen door because nothing must come in. I think, I think ants can barely creep in through some little crevices. No mosquitoes, no bugs, no lizards. If there's a lizard, if a lizard gets into the house, it's a major crisis. Nobody will sleep tonight until I find that lizard. Whatever I'm doing, I have to leave it and I have to go and hunt for that lizard and catch it and get rid of it. Usually I catch it and I throw it away over in the bush, okay? Because it's a lizard. But rats are especially abhorrent. They're not permitted. Every, we, the house is sealed. I always say if there's a fire, we'll have a hard time getting out before something happens. But anyway. 
um, my wife, I want my wife to be happy. So a few days ago, sometime last week, she came to me and showed me there, we had a couple of big sweet potatoes on the, on the stove. One of them, something had eaten through the aluminum foil that it was wrapped in and had eaten out a, a, a good amount of the baked potato. And she said, what do you think could have done this? I looked at it and the only thing I could think of is a rat. A rat had to have done this. But there's no way, impossible, because a rat can't get into this house. It's, it's like Fort Knox. No rat can get in here. Now, rats, you know, are especially, especially hateful because in, in Jamaica, I, I'm not sure if everywhere, but in Jamaica, some of them carry a disease called leptospirosis. And what they do, they walk around and they urinate and things. And if you touch it and, and you happen to get this into your body, leptospirosis can kill you. So, you know, rats are especially no, no. And they are, they, are, they are rodents, they eat up everything, but also there's that danger, you know. Uh, more than one of my friends some have, have, have gotten leptospirosis because of handling stuff that rats crawl on. So this was a, a, a major crisis that there could possibly be a rat in the house, but we didn't accept that. So anyway, a couple of days later, my wife came to me with her eyes wide and she said, if you, if you know the size of the rat that I just saw in the kitchen. So... I rushed to the kitchen with my, with my machete in hand. And um, some of you might say machete. In Jamaica, we say machete, okay? I ran to the kitchen with my machete in hand, hunted through, up and down, searched the kitchen to every corner. There was no sign of any rat. So we sealed the door, put things across the door so nothing could get out. But now there's a major issue because my wife can't go in the kitchen to work because there's a rat in there. So I'm not going to get any dinner or any, anything. Nothing is going to happen. We have to get this rat. So no sign of this rat. So, so we got some of those glue traps and we placed the traps. And um, we went out a little bit. And then a little, a, little, a little later, we came back and saw that one of the glue traps was full of rat here. Apparently, the rat got, his body got on the trap and he got away, which means that it's a strong rat. Uh, because this is one of the big glue shops and he got away and still no sign of the rat no matter where we search we can't find this rat anyway a little later on my wife called again we put some roasted coconut on, on the trap rats love roasted coconut in a little while there was a little clattering in there and when i went there was a scoundrel a big rat so i took him outside with a machete and i put him down on the ground and i looked at the rat and I, I, I knew his crime. His crime was that he was a rat. And his second crime was that he, he, he came into my kitchen and endangered my, the, the serenity of my family. And for this, he must die. Now, my wife, who is generally very meek and gentle, and I know she won't want me to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. She surprised me. She said, we should just get some spray and spray in his eyes. startled me i never knew she had that in her but she was so upset at this rat because for her a rodent getting into the house and somehow we have no idea how the rat got into the house somehow this this endangered the serenity of our environment so she said so i i, I said no we can't do this the rat the, the rat the rat is a danger to us so it has to die but we wouldn't want the rat to suffer what did he do to suffer he was just being a rat and so, you know, I hit him with a machete in, in his neck, I killed it and got rid of it. Now, there are several things I want to, to, to I, I learned from this rat. The first thing that came to my mind was the rat had done nothing wrong in terms of rat nature. If the rat carries leptospirosis, whose fault is that? Is this something the rat does deliberately? If the rat has the nature to eat up my food, is this something that the rat deliberately does to annoy me? And yet, when we catch the rat, our, our upset at being, we are so upset at being disadvantaged. And, and the danger this rat has brought us into that, sometimes we even want to hurt the rat more. But reason says the rat has to die. But you don't have to make the rat suffer. You want the rat, you want to get rid of the danger. But why make the rat suffer for being a rat? And it reminded me of something. If you look at Romans 7, 
I know I'm a little over time. I'm going to rub a, little, a couple of minutes this, 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 this morning. If you look at Romans 7, verses 18 to 19, it says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. I'm no better than the rat. For to will is present with me. I want to do good. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. If you look at chapter 5 and verse 19, Romans 5, it explains why human beings are this way. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. It wasn't the rat's fault that he was a rat. And it wasn't my fault that I was born a sinner. Romans 7 and verse 20. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. You can't blame somebody for being himself. You can't blame a rat for being a rat. But still, even though the rat is being a rat, what must happen to the rat? The rat must die. The rat must die. And why must it die? Because in spite of the fact that it can't help itself, the rat carries leptospirosis. The rat, the, the rat gets into a place where he endangers my family. He's going to urinate on my dishes, eat up my food. I have to get rid of the rat. The rat has to die. I'm learning a lesson from the rat. But I'm not hating the rat. But I see the need to get rid of the rat. Now, let me tell you another story about another rat. Okay, because I said it's a tale of two rats. One day I was sitting in my living room and my daughter was here and she said, Daddy, there's a rat in the yard. I grabbed my machete, my tool of choice, and I ran outside. Anywhere I see a rat, anywhere in the environment, that rat is going to die. I ran outside with my machete and I raised the machete to strike and the little rat, a little mouse, started walking towards me. The mouse started walking towards me. Uh, that has never happened to me and any rat in my life. So there was a moment of shock and surprise. And I let down my machete. And this little rat crawled right up to my feet and sat down. My desire to strike this rat changed. I said to myself, this rat must be sick. Something is wrong with this rat. So I was, I was cautious. My grandson came out and he said, Grandpa, he looks hungry. Let me feed him. <laughs> I said, I said, no, okay, we can't feed a rat, man. We don't want to encourage a rat around you. He said, Grandpa, he looks hungry. Let me feed him. So anyway, he got a little biscuit. He gave it to the little mouse. And the mouse tucked in and ate off that biscuit. Ate all of it. Sat down at our feet and ate. I poked him with a stick. He wouldn't move. He wouldn't run. We started to walk away. The mouse started walking after us. All of a sudden, everything changed about this mouse. I still had my machete in hand, but now I was looking to see if any cats were passing because the first, the first thought was that I would throw this mouse to a cat, but now I was looking to see if there's a cat that tries to hit this, eat this mouse. I'm going to attack the cat. Uh, suddenly, I changed from, from the destroyer of this mouse. I was now the protector of this mouse. I was kind of surprised at myself. Why was I doing this? I realized that the only difference, this mouse was still possibly carrying leptospirosis. Possibly. Not all of them do, right? And this mouse, if it got into the house, would probably eat up my food. And yet here I am thinking differently of this mouse. And what is the reason? Because the mouse trusts me. The only difference was that this little mouse put his trust in me. He would not run from me. He was not afraid of me. He was putting his confidence in me and my whole attitude to the mouse changed. Before I was ready to destroy the mouse, now I'm ready to protect this mouse. I never knew I could learn spiritual lessons from rats, but I did. And I, I learned and I, it was reinforced in my mind. Why the only thing God asks of us brothers and sisters is that we trust him. That's the only thing. Why, when we're afraid of God and we are doing all our damage, the only thing that he can do is one day he says, with tears in my eyes, I have to remove you. You're a danger to my universe. I can't allow you to live 
in a place that is good. But if you're a little mouse and you come and you follow him around and you say, I know you can't harm me. I know you, 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 you will feed me and you will do me well. I like to be with you. In amazement, God says, I will protect you from anybody who tries to hurt you. And more than this, I would even take you into my home because to be honest, I thought of doing that. I thought of making this rat into a pet. I thought of, if it wasn't for the fact that the, the, the rat might be a carrier of disease. I thought, this rat is so friendly. It would be nice to feed him and r raise him and see what happens. But I, I didn't want to take the chance because it might have disease. So what I did eventually, I took it and I put it over the wall in an open lot. I couldn't kill that mouse. And I hoped that a, 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 a cat wouldn't get it or, or a hawk wouldn't get it. But I couldn't kill that mouse. And I, I remember that mouse because that's the only rat in my life that ever trusted me like that. And therefore, it's the only rat that I came across and I never killed. And it helped me to understand why God can never hurt anybody who trusts him. And why God only asks one thing. God says, have faith, trust in God. And if you trust in God and you don't think that God means you, you harm if you understand that God wants you for yourself and loves you just because of you, and all he wants is that you trust him. If you understand this, this is the guarantee that God will always protect you and always have his arms around you. And furthermore, he will cure you of the leptospirosis so he can afford for you to come and live in his home. So, that is the lesson I learned from those two rats. And I thank God that I can think of him in this way. And I thank God that I know he's my friend. When I go to God, when we go to God, brothers and sisters, we don't go because we have to. We don't go because we are threatened that if we don't come, this is going to happen. We go because we want to. I like to be with him. He doesn't threaten me and say, if you don't come, this is what will happen. I am there because I want to. And when I go to pray, it's because I want to, not because I'm obligated to pray. When you do things from obligation, it's unpleasant. When I went to school as a boy, I went because my parents sent me for my five, how many years? Maybe 10 years in, in, in primary school and high school. I went because I was told to go. I never enjoyed school. There were moments, but I never liked having to get up and go all these miles to school. And then sometimes the teacher would give you a beating or whatever. I did it because I had to. When I became a man, I chose to go to college. Nobody sent me. I chose to go on my own. And when I went to college, I enjoyed it. I, I, I loved the life. And I think I did well as well also, but it was a big difference, you know, because I was doing something that I wanted to do. It's like that with God. When you, when you seek him because you have to, there is pressure. God doesn't want that kind of relationship. Like you don't want it. He wants you to come because you know that he's warm and loving and welcoming. And he's not demanding. He's accepting you as a little broken rat. He's accepting you as a little nothing. He's accepting you the way you are. And he's saying, I like you. Even though you might, might be a, a carrier of evil things, I like you. Because you trust me. I like you and I want you. And I want to help you to become everything that I ever want you to be so that we can live together. Anyway, I don't want to overdo it. My time is up. I want to thank you all for listening. And I hope that in this presentation, you have been able to find something that you can find valuable in your experience with the Lord. God bless you and have a wonderful day. I'm going to hand over to Brother Howard now after we have the closing prayer.